Welcome to Youth in Agriculture. My name is Jeffrey Morley and welcome to our farm here, Vita Plant Kenya. We are based in Naivasha, growing medicinal plants and various herbs on 200 hectares. Everything we produce is for export to the European market. Uh, it would be my pleasure to show you around our farm. Okay, I am, I'm born and bred in Kenya. Uh, I come from a farming family. My grandparents were farmers, their parents before them were farmers. Uh, to be honest, I don't know any further back than that, but I assume they were also farmers. So you could say that farming is really in my blood. I grew up in Uganda. I studied agriculture at university in the UK. As soon as I graduated, I came back and I started working in farming. I initially took a job in Northern Kenya then I spent a few years working in agriculture in Uganda, where I learned a lot. And um, most recently, I have taken the job here of managing the company Vita Plant Kenya. Our company Vita Plant specializes in the production of um, difficult to manage, difficult to grow difficult to source plants from all around the world. So in fact, all of the plants that you see us growing here, they're not actually plants which are indigenous to Kenya. All of these plants grow naturally outside of here, and we have brought them in to produce them in this country. Now, why do we produce these plants in Kenya instead of in the US or Asia, Europe, South America, something like that? Um, the reality is it was a long, long process of trial and error, trying to find out which plants we can produce here, which plants contain the active ingredients that we're looking for, and uh, which plants potentially grow, potentially grow more economically in Kenya than they do in other parts of the world. And it's a, it's a simple fact that in some cases you get a plant which is indigenous to uh, Europe, a plant which is indigenous to Asia, you bring it to Kenya and it grows better in this soil with this climate than it would in its own local area where it actually comes from. We cultivate these plants here. I process them in my warehouse here in Naivasha. I dry them and then we export to Europe where they are used in making human grade pharmaceutical products. You know, a lot of the perception in this industry when I bring somebody here to my farm and they say, okay, what are you doing? You're growing herbs, you're growing spices. Um, a lot of people think about homeopathic. A lot of people think about, you know, witch doctor medicine, these sort of fad diets. But the reality is a lot of what we produce is real registered pharmaceutical products. In some cases, even prescription that you have to buy it from a doctor or a pharmacy. We produce some plants where we harvest fruits, others where we harvest roots, leaves, flowers, etc. Um, and you know, our, our product range varies from rather common plants. You might think of thyme, lemon balm, even stinging nettle, to some more complicated plants which you don't see very commonly on a lot of farms, especially in Kenya. If, if you come to my farm today, you will see that I am producing at any time between 10 and 15 different plants. Those are my commercially produced plants, which um, we have an export market for. But the reality is on my trial site, and by the way, we've invested almost 15 acres here just for trials. We've, we've trialed almost 100, I would say, different types of plants from around the world. The very, very first step in the whole process is selection of the plant. Selection of the plant is normally a coming together of market. It has to have a market. You know, there's many plants here that I could grow and grow them very well, but unless I have a ready market, it doesn't make sense for me to produce that plant. Once I've gone through the selection process and I've chosen a plant, I then do another selection process of going through all of the varieties that I can find that are available to me, whether it be seed, whether it be imported cuttings, 
whether it be um, genetic material that somebody else is growing in Kenya, we do another selection where it's basically a variety screening. We take the results of that variety screening, um, test all of the samples in the lab, and normally what I then have at the end of that process, and it takes about two years, is uh, we will have a variety of a plant which grows well and a customer in Europe. My most common product, uh, problems are caterpillars and cutworms, and I've had great success on my organic fields and my conventional fields using flower DS after planting. We then allow the plant to grow, um, depending on what we're looking for, whether it's roots, flowers, leaves, every plant has a different harvesting stage. Of course, we have to manage and take care of the field throughout its lifetime. And then, um, then comes time to harvest. From harvest, I have a various processing and drying facilities here in my warehouse and then of course packaged and exported to Switzerland. We are governed by a document which is called the European Pharmacopoeia that is basically a guideline or a handbook for producing medicine in Europe and in it there details um, residue tolerances, growing protocols, and all of the things that I have to follow to be able to produce and sell plant material into the medicinal world in Europe. And basically, if I have insect problems before harvest, the only way that I can produce according to that document is by using flower DS, because I know that if I use flower DS before harvest, that I will not have any traces of residues in my products when they test it in Switzerland. Aside from using flower DS in that window after planting, when I need to protect my most vulnerable plants, I also use uh, the product flower dust. Flower dust, as you know, is a uh, powderized product. We buy it in sacks. And that, in my case, acts as a physical barrier between the pest and the plant. So by placing a small amount of flower dust at the base of every single seedling, um, I have a physical barrier that kills any kind of crawling insects that would come from the soil and attack my crop. You see machines moving around farms and the first thing that people think about is, okay, the reason why they have a machine is because they're trying to cut cost. And, and in some cases that is true. If you look at tea harvesters in Karicha, you know, people have invested in machinery to really try and cut cost. What we try and do here at Vita Plant because we absolutely depend on the influence of somebody being in the field, using their eyes, using their hands. I cannot do everything by machine. It's one of the reasons why I'm here doing business in Kenya. Um, we use machines where necessary and we use machines where a machine can do a better job than a person. For example, I would draw your attention to a sprayer. If I use a trail sprayer or a self-propelled sprayer, I'm able to spray a much wider area, much more safely than having people with knapsacks being exposed to that chemical throughout the field. If I look at a harvester, I can have a machine come and do a very clean cut. I reduce the risk of contamination onto my plants because it's less people touching the product itself. Um, and, you know, I have some weeding machines that can weed at a very early stage after planting where I cannot risk having people walking in the field and potentially destroying the plants. But the reality is that I absolutely depend on um, working with people to preserve my quality. It's one of the advantages of producing here in Kenya compared to farmers who grow in Europe is that I can have a team of people who can be in the field every day inspecting the plants as they go throughout their work. You know, somebody in the course of the day is always in every single field. They're keeping an eye on the pest pressure. They're looking out for diseases. And of course, they're able to weed where a machine cannot, in between the plants, in sensitive areas, around the root zone. And for me, the combination of having hand labor plus some mechanization means that I'm able to produce a very, very clean product compared to anywhere else in the world. Um, 
We employ over 200 people here in Kenya. We employ another 100 people in Uganda. Um, so, I mean, the reality is, is we absolutely depend on our team in the field. I irrigate most of my plants, either through center pivot irrigation, through drip irrigation, or through overhead sprinklers. And I have the luxury that on the farm here we have boreholes with access to underground water and also being based in Naivasha, so close to the lake, we can also extract lake water and use that for irrigation. So when the lake is at sufficient levels that allow extraction, we use lake water. Whenever the lake is at a critical level, we're able to use borehole water as an emergency. And of course, there's no water like the one which Mungu gives you out of the sky. So Vita Plant, um, the farm that we're on now, um, produces high-end medicinal herbs for export. It's strictly organic and because it's for medicinal use, there can be no trace of any sort of chemical residue at all. It's incredibly strictly controlled. Vita Plant started here in 2018. They inherited a farm that was conventionally run. It had previously used um, synthetic chemicals for the vegetables that were grown here. When Vita Plant arrived, they needed organic crop. We believe passionately that Kenyans need to wake up to the danger of residues caused by the harmful chemicals. Currently, most of the vegetables and fruits sold in Kenya have got harmful chemical residues. We, we are backing the banning of the harmful chemicals. We're not at all trying to look to ban chemicals generally that there is a real and growing market for quality foodstuffs. Let me just tell you, the foundation of all of this farm began in this small field where I'm standing now. Um, and this is my trial field, my site where I do all of my research and development. Without this, we wouldn't have any of the plants which we're producing commercially now in the fields. So, I mean, you have to imagine that it takes a long time. Sometimes it's expensive, but if you don't try, you'll never know. And by trying different combinations of plants, by introducing different species, you know, there's a chance that you could find something that really works for you, which you can produce um, commercially. My message to the youth of Kenya would be this. I understand that a lot of Kenyan farms are producing food crops for, for sale in Kenya. You know, you have people producing cabbages, tomatoes, onions, maize, wheat, potatoes. And while we absolutely rely on that as a nation, what I advocate for, and let it not be mistaken before I say this, there's a, there's a, I believe a misconception that everything except food crops grown for local sale has to be a big expensive investment where you need to put in greenhouses and irrigation and grow um, roses or cut flowers for export. It doesn't have to be the case. As a Kenyan farmer starting out, maybe a new graduate, a young person looking up, you know, maybe somebody who their family has a farm and of course they've been educated, they've gone to university. And then of course the family says, okay, now what do we grow? Um, what the point I was trying to make is maybe we should not just grow maize or wheat. Let's have a plan. Let's get away from this system of just having a small farm with a cow and a whatever and 
producing plants that we keep throughout the year and maybe we smell a small amount in the market and the rest we eat at home. I would say rather use that farm as a business. Plan. Do your research. Look into the market. Investigate what kind of plants grow well in that area. Have a look at what markets are available. Have a look at how you can link to markets somewhere else. Maybe a little bit further away, but there's people who would come and collect and give you access to that market. I understand it's easier said than done, but with a little bit of planning, there's a lot of opportunity for people in this country to grow high value plants, sell them regionally, sell them locally, export internationally, and make good profit. And of course, then with the profit that you make, you can reinvest into your land. And of course, you can buy the food that you need for your family. Um, just while I'm thinking off the top of my head, people would say, OK, give me the plant. What can I grow? Can I be an outgrower? Really, there's a lot of opportunities for people in Kenya. We're here in my trial field. Um, as you can see, this is a plant I have under investigation currently. Um, it's a plant which I am not aware is grown anywhere in Kenya. But as you can see, we have some really promising results. And I'm very happy with the results. Um, interestingly, the product which I harvest from this plant is the fruit. And um, absolutely critical to the production of fruit is pollination of my flowers. So I don't know if you'll see all around us in this field, we have butterflies, bees, bumblebees, wasps. Those are all of my pollinators. Here we are where I'm standing. If we look around, you can see that I've got a trial currently going with different varieties of chili plants. Uh, we have echinacea flowers in the background, artichokes, rosemary, and a whole variety of different plants. So this is really where everything comes. Um, this has been an interesting trial, learning about the best ways to produce chilies. What we're trying to optimize is a combination of yield, and capsaicin. Capsaicin is the active ingredient in a chili pepper which makes it hot and that's what my customer is looking for. So I have a selection here of 25 different chili varieties to see in this location what works the best. You would ask how does one produce uh, chilies without insect damage and still be able to sell that produce into the European pharmaceutical market. Um, and that is pure and simple because we have access to Carpi Flower DS, which means I can control basically any kind of insect that I would need to control in this field without worry of the residues remaining on the fruit. These are all of my dryers. We have 12 of these machines and they all work every day. All of this has just freshly come out of the dryer today. You can hear that it's dry. You can feel that it's dry. Of course, we test everything with a moisture meter to make sure that it comes out of the dryer with the correct humidity. Um, but I cannot export this crop as it is right now. The first thing I need to do is remove all of these um, stems, branches, uh, and try and isolate just the leaf material. So what I do to separate the leaf from the stems is I, we had to invest in this huge machine. <laughs> this, uh, this is my finished material packaged and ready for shipping. Thank you so much for keeping it here. That is where we wrap up on today's episode of Youth in Agriculture. And like always, if you have a story that you want to share with us, let us know through the uh, SMS code that is on your screen. But until next time, enjoy the rest of our programs. Mm -hmm.